Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode 165 of Buds and Blue Jays, your place for all things related to the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm Jesse Burrell, joined by Riley McConnell, and no intro music today. We're working on something new as we get excited into the season, something that I think you guys are all going to really like out there. So for this one, we're doing the cold intro, baby. We're going right in. We're going hot because we got a lot to talk about on our episode. Riley? We made it, my guy. This is the official 2024 season preview for the Toronto Blue Jays this year. We couldn't be more excited. It was a long off season. A lot of things happened, and then a lot of things didn't happen. But as of next week, baseball begins, Riley. How excited are you? Well, man, I'll tell you how excited I am. Uh, baseball, the regular season, begins you know, later on next week for us. But actually, mm -hmm. in the South Korean uh uh, country of South Korea, there is uh, two teams, the Padres and the Dodgers, who played at 6 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And I woke up and I watched four innings before I had to go to work and uh, got to see not Toronto Blue Jay Shohei Otani <laughs> rip his first hit as a Dodger and proceed to steal first base. So uh, if that tells you how 2024 is going to go, just in general, it's going to be a good season. Uh, mm -hmm. There was, you know, a lot of good transactions around the league, this and that. If you're a Blue Jays fan, hey, we can still kind of remain faithful to our homegrown crew. How good are they going to be this year? Jesse and I will talk about that. That's exactly it. We've been trying to set expectations for how things have gone all offseason. We're going to do the same thing here in this episode. For those of you who are just joining the show, if you are new here, welcome. Glad to have you. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. Please do all that fun stuff. Well, our show is a little bit different during the regular season than it is here during the offseason. In the offseason, we come at you with one episode a week, usually talking for an hour, usually telling crazy stories, getting wild, getting freaky on the show a little bit. In the regular season, things are a little more calm. They're a little more composed. We do try to do an episode after the end of every single series. We like to give our thumbs up and our thumbs down, our winners and losers, if you will, of the current series. Look at the things on the farm. Look at the prospects. And we come at you with two episodes a week during the regular season. So please make sure you subscribe, like the channel, and follow along with us all throughout the regular season. You don't want to miss that. But Riley, without any further ado, you ready to get into it? The official preview for the 2024 Toronto Blue Jays season. Let's talk about it. Let's get her done. And like Jesse said, guys, uh, this is we will do this in the off seasons. But what we love to do is break down mm -hmm. those two game, three game, four game series. Doesn't matter. Jesse and I will give you those recaps. And if you like what we do in the off season, you're, you'll surely love what we present to you after a good hard fought series. All right, well, let's get into it. And Riley, it is no secret that the Toronto Blue Jays will go as far as Vladimir Guerrero Jr. will take them this year. And I think the top storyline for us to follow going into this season is just simply the performance of our big dog, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. How is he going to do? Is he going to come back to that MVP form we know he has in there? We talked about him a lot this season, but just to give you the Coles notes last season, 26 home runs, 94 RBIs, played 156 games, but a 788 OPS, which was his lowest since his rookie season. Expectations are high for Vladdy going into this year. He's coming to camp in better shape. And for what it's worth, he's had a monster spring, three home runs, OPS over 1,200. He's the cover boy on the new MLB The Show. The projection system still love Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And the things that he's talked about this year is swinging at the pitches he knows he can do damage with because he is so good on those pitches, Riley. How are we feeling? Do we think that big season is coming from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. this year? I mean, it is very hard to top what he did in his MVP runner-up season in 2021. Mm -hmm. And then in 2022, we can look back at Vladdy and say, hey, he kind of took a you know step back. 2022, we can forgive that. Um, we look at last year and what he did in 2023, and we go, wow, is this guy – age 35, 36, 37. It's like, no, like that's, we're 15 years behind that. Uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is still very young. The sky is the ceiling for him. And yep. I think the, it, like in spring training, he's, he, he looks great. Jesse, like you said, three home runs, he hits the ball extremely hard, whether it's a worm burner or the absolute missile um, that he hit. I don't, I, I, I don't even know who he's playing. That's how much spring training games mean to me. You forget the <laughs> opponent of a lot of it. I know he hit an absolute nuke. I know he had another one today. And I think those are all good signs. Uh, take it uh, what you will for spring training games. But the fact that we are seeing Vladimir Guerrero Jr. 
elevate that ball is fantastic. His Mm bat-to-ball skills is very real. This is a guy for his power that does not strike out a ton. This is a premium type hitter um, where Vladimir Guerrero Jr. at his highest ceiling. He's the kind of guy, and I mean, if he hit 48, there's a chance he could hit 50. Whoa, I'm going to back that up a bit, but I'm going to say 40 home runs is certainly an achievable mark. And a 300 batting average is also an achievable mark if Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is at his very best. And I think that's what it's going to take for him to be an MVP. Now, I would be satisfied with 35 home runs, something like that. But we Mm -hmm. can't have a sub-30 home run season for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And where he just isn't getting on base or even hitting for extra bases. It seems that every major hitting, uh, either counting stat or average stats, um, whatever it may be, kind of took a dive um, since 2021, 2022, and then last year in 2023. So for him to return, I think it is very much possible. And for the Blue Jays, they're going to need that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. if they are going to, A, make a run at the uh, division, or two, yep. uh, like if he plays the same way he did last year, I think that really – really decreases the Blue Jays' odds of even making it to the postseason. Yeah, that is the big thing. We need that MVP guy to come back, and we really need it. Uh, Two things with Vlad. The game's played. He's been fairly durable the last three seasons. He's played 156 games or more in each of the last three, but the power numbers have kind of dipped a little bit, going from 48 to 32 to just 26 last season. Don Mattingly seems to have fixed what has gone on with Vlad Swing, and if early indications this spring mean anything it does probably show that vlad is set for a good year you talked about the home run total i'm going to give you a prop for vladimir guerrero jr 33 and a half is the line riley mcconnell are we going over are we going under give i'm gonna say, i'm gonna say over i'm gonna say that uh, i'm not you know don't keep this in stone but i think high 30s would be a good mark and i think that's very achievable i'm going over on 33 and a half for sure Oh, it's tough because he's only done that one time in his career, and that was the MVP season. But, man, let's be real. I'm impressed. I'm floored. It, it, we're, we're in spring training season. We're very optimistic. I'm with you as well, Riley McConnell. I'm feeling the over on Vladimir Guerrero Jr., 33 and a half home runs this season. We've got to move on to the next player. And if this team is going to be carried by Vladimir Guerrero Jr., the guy on his back, the guy helping him push that castle up into the pennant to climb that mountain is our shortstop. And that is Bo Bichette, who last season had a very good year as well. The defense took a step forward and he hit over 300, 306, 20 home runs and 814 OPS. And he only played in 135 games last year as he was dealing with that leg injury later into the season. Um, he was on pace to lead the American League in hits again if he didn't get injury, and he's become a rock at the top of that lineup here. He's going to be consistent. He's been hitting the ball hard this spring. Again, he had an exit velocity. Um, I think that would have been his third highest hit of all of last year, so good things to see. He's talked a lot more this offseason, too, about, you know, it's it's time for us to get it done. We're not necessarily the young guys, the baby Jays. It's about development. It's time now to get on the field to produce and get stuff done. And I like that from our star shortstop in Bo Bichette. So how are we feeling, Riley? Is there another gear here in Bo Bichette's game? Or is just us platinum of consistency what we're going to get from this guy? I love a consistent Bo Bichette because I would say that d- despite the injury, he still finished with a very good season line last year, especially with that 300 average. I think that's yeah. what you can expect. Um, it's a guy, If I, I say he does get the 200 hit total, but this guy is a hit compiler and you're seeing the danger. See, the thing about a guy like Luis Arias, who is a... <laughs> The National League going to probably be the National League hit leader if I was to put money on it, which I won't. Um, the difference is Bo Bichette has the ability to – he has that extra base pop. And if yeah. any time Bo Bichette I, – I, I, I think there's a world, Jesse, and it could be this year, it could be some point, that Bo Bichette, some of those doubles he hits hard off the wall, leave the ballpark, and he has a season where he hits 30, 35 home runs. That is nowhere near any okay. question with the amount of – uh, bat on um, ball this guy gets. I mean, he's a shoe in. You know, he's not going to take his walks, but his defense is improving. Um, I think that uh, speed is kind of a non factor with him. He's still very mobile. The fact that he doesn't steal a ton of bags is fine by me as long as he runs the bases smart. Um, yep. He's he's a top of the order guy for us. He will be for a long time, I hope, because he is that dangerous. Um, as far as Bo Bichette goes, if if 
there is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. as our team MVP. But if anybody is to be the best complimentary piece for Vladimir Guerrero Jr., it is Bo Bichette. He is one of the most dangerous hitters in baseball if there are runners on base. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't get a lot of those guys in, but I feel, have a good feeling uh, Bo Bichette is going to get a lot of run scoring himself by getting on base. And yep. driving the bottom of the order, guys, when he is up at the plate. Because I, I think it's about hits. He's going to compile a ton of hits again this year. Yeah, 175 and only 135 games last year. In fact, I was looking this up before the episode. He's actually the third most likely favorite to lead baseball in hits. You can get it at about 10 to 1 odds right now. Luis Arise, as you mentioned, is first in baseball to probably do it. And then Ronald Acuna, surprising nobody, is ahead of him. Um, he's always tied with Freddie Freeman on getting hits. And if all those three players are in the National League. So it seems like Bo Bichette is the favorite to lead the American League in hits once again. I don't think it'll surprise anybody if he gets there. Bo Bichette, though, has got to stay healthy. He absolutely has to. We saw what happened to that injury down the stretch last year, which might have affected his stolen bases, actually. I'm probably betting he gets closer to 15 stolen bags or closer to the five he had last year, um, which is a plus. The It's easier to steal bases in the big leagues this year. So if Bo Bichette is healthy, he should be able to do that. Um, but you can't count on it anymore, I suppose. But yeah, if he's healthy, he's productive, he's on the field. I would love to see Bo Bichette actually just start to walk just a little bit more. I, I know you don't want to take away the things in his game that make him great. And he already is such a great hitter. It's, it's tough to change that. But if he could spit on those pitches down in the zone, those pitches on the corner, those pitches on the black, and he could start walking a little bit more, we could see another leap in Bo Bichette's game. And if that does happen, and we have two MVP worthy type players on our roster, then this Blue Jays is going to be a much higher to reaching that 90, 95 win ceiling and potentially winning this division. I so agree with you. If, if things are going right for the Jays, with Guerrero Jr. and Bichette, then it is a 90 win type team. Yeah. Uh, like, Bo Bichette is that kind of player. To touch on the walks, he's only walked once in spring training, and he's got he's got a handful of at bats, 45 at bats, one walk drawn. Mm -hmm. So we know what we're going to get. There is. A, yes, Jesse, we do. Mr. A, Consistency. There's, Bo there's a lot of hits. There's a lot of potential for extra bases. Yeah. And I like it. He's, he's a, he's a, you know, I wouldn't say an underrated player. I think, I think the league has really taken notice uh, to this guy because he is a pain for pitchers. And I mean, yeah, plate discipline will be great, Jesse. Um, but if he's hitting the ball and putting himself in a situation to score runs for the mm -hmm. big boys to step up, then I'm all for it. All right. Me too. It's going to be great to see another storyline that we have for the Toronto Blue Jays going into this season. And I'm going to lump these three hitters together is what do we get from our aging, but should still be productive uh, performers So guys who are coming off of down years last year. And I'm going to put George Springer, Justin Turner, and Alejandro Kirk, the three of them all in this, uh, in this section here, because for all of them, well, I guess not so Kirk, he's younger, but they're aging or they had poor performances last year or we had question marks about their ability at the plate. And I'll start with George Springer here. He Last year, he was healthy. The move to right field seemed to pay off. He paid 154 games and he went 20-20, 21 home runs, 20 stolen bases, but he had a 734 OPS and there were some signs in decline in George Springer's game last year. The exit velocity numbers weren't as good. The walks went down, the strikeouts went up and he was very vulnerable to sliders. And um, one of the things I've said on this show many times, and I'll say it again for you guys here, is that the first sign of a player aging is its inability to catch up to the four-seam fastball. And George Bringer's bread and butter throughout his career was he was able to crush the four-seam fastball. That wasn't the case last year. Um, he went to actually a negative run value against it, and he'll be entering his th age 34-year-old season. I'm not certain about him. And you can echo a lot of those things for Justin Turner too. Just 39 years old, struggled to hit the fastball a bit towards the end of the season here. And um, yeah, I, if you want to hear more on Justin Turner, we talked about it last episode and what my thoughts are on that. But those two players, especially, and then you can get into Kirk if you'd like here. Um, how confident are you that these guys are going to be highly productive players going into the 2024 season? So I'll be, I'll just kind of be quick on this one and say, quite mm -hmm. honestly, like, I think we'll expect the same thing with George Springer. I think that, uh, I think that a seven, um, I think uh, between 700 and 750 OPS um, is, is not out of the question. I'm really not sold on Justin Turner at all. I know he's had a fairly decent spring, but Jesse, mm -hmm. we've talked and even behind the scenes, like you and I are not huge on him over the course of what we think is going to transpire this year. 
Uh, the interesting one out of the three, because he's so different, is Alejandro Kirk, because he is a, a generation of ball players younger than those two. And yep. I think that Alejandro Kirk has shown this spring um, that the bat is coming alive. I don't know if I buy into that 100% for the regular season, but I will say this. And um, I came on here and barked a lot of things last episode, one of them being I think Danny Jance is going to have a great year. Well, as it turns out, guys, Jance is probably headed to the IL to start the year. So I think Kirk yes. has to. Like that bat, if, if we're missing one of the better power hitting catchers in Danny Jansen, I really hope that with Kirk, even if, uh, I mean, he had three he had three home runs in, in, I think he has two home runs or three home runs this spring. Three home runs, a couple doubles too. I think four. Sure, runs. that's, and that's yeah. fantastic. I mean, three home runs in the first month of the season for Kirk, and I'm mind blown. I just want to see the bat to ball. Um, because he is a good kind of six six hitter on this team, where in the middle of that batting order, um, you know, when after the run pr run producers have, you know, hopefully driven in the runs, that he's a guy that kind of keeps the ball rolling. And mm -hmm. in his first full season, he kind of did that for a while, and then he's really slowed down since he was named an All Star and a Silver Slugger and and all that. So. I'm less confident, like, you know, that I think Vlad can resurge his kind of all-star caliber MVP before Kirk does. But I would like to see more consistency with Alejandro Kirk. He's going to need to, you know, quite literally and um, like step up to the plate and in and, and, and yeah, Jansen's I, presence. At least right. if it's not if he's not going to provide the power that Jansen will at least step in and fill in a spot where you're getting bat to ball and the on base percentage is way up. Yeah, I agree. For what it's worth with Alejandro Kirk this spring, his swing does look a little different. He's added like a little toe tap and it he hit a home run early in the spring on a pitch. He would have rolled over and grounded out last year. So that is good. Small sample size for Kirk. So caveats apply, but he is hitting the ball in the air more and he has had more home runs than strikeouts. I don't think we expect that to continue in the regular season, but it is worth noting. Uh, my props for these three players, Riley, two of them are home run props. Um, Alejandro Kirk, I put out 11 and a half home runs which would be an improvement from the eight he hit last year. And George Springer, they're even giving him an improvement too because he only hit 21 last season. His prop is 23 and a half over under on those two. I'm going under on both, not by a ton. I don't, I, like, hey, I think, I think it's not by much. Let's say that Kirk has nine and Springer has 18, 19. Like that's not too far off, but, but lower on both of them. Um, it's just, it's, you know, and it's nothing on Kirk. Like I, I what needs to improve for him is the batting average. I don't think the power is going to necessarily turn him into a 15 home run hitter. Um, high single digits would be great, but that batting average and the, and you know, his ability to draw walks needs to kind of be there for this team to be successful. It'll be something to watch early in the season for sure, because Kirk is going to get a lot of playing time early on in the year. And one more thing on Justin Turner, before we uh, turn the page on him, if he is a full-time DH, this really does hurt the Blue Jays in a way. We saw how Kendris Morales really affected the Blue Jays not being able to play in the field. If we can put Justin Turner occasionally at second base, or more importantly, occasionally at third base and get a guy like a Daniel Vogelbach, or if George Springer needs a DH day, or if Jansen's healthy, Jansen can have a DH day. It really does make this team click and it can reach its upside more if Justin Turner could play an admirable third base. The Blue Jays haven't put him out there at once at all this spring training, so I don't think they're going to during the regular season unless there is an injury or something dramatic happens. But my over-under for Justin Turner, Riley, is four and a half um, games not at DH, at a non-DH position. So I guess he could pretty cheat. He probably gets at least five games at first base, but I put it at four and a half. What do you say for Justin Turner? I I, I I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the over. Like this is a guy, a 39 year old DH who's not named David Ortiz. I think I think it's a lot a lot of irrelevancy in what he can do defensively. We know why the Jays brought him in. Oh, he's our DH, and we kind of go we kind of snickered and went, okay, well, what's he gonna yep. do at DH? Um, and we've looked at what the ceiling possibly is. We're not super impressed. So if he can play a little bit of defense to go with that, then I guess it makes it a, a little bit okay. Still kind of a sour taste. I hope he can yeah. perform because with the players that were on the table, we talked about this in episodes far prior to this one. Um, yeah, if, if he can't play defense at all, then I'm still kind of shaking my head at the trade. 
or the uh, signing, sorry. But uh, yeah, five, five, five games at first base should be the bottom line. I agree, especially if, God forbid, something does happen to Vladdy or Vladdy just needs a few DH days. Justin Turner is going to primarily fill in at first base. The next players, the players that are going to see significant offensive time with the Toronto Blue Jays, and I'm putting these three players together, Riley. Dalton Varsho, Kevin Biggio, and Davis Schneider. All three guys who got a lot of playing time, especially when after Davis Schneider came up last year. Guys who maybe underperformed a bit with the exception of Davis Schneider. He hit the ground running. We know the Davis Schneider story, but guys who I think we're both pretty optimistic can have a very impactful season this year. Um, Kevin Biggio, for example, if you look at a season line, 235 with nine home runs, but he finally got that WRC plus over 100 turning into a league average bat last year. And it was better in the second half with an over 400 on base percentage in that second half. He's getting on base in more than half of his at bat so far this spring. Spring training means nothing, I know, but it is very good to see. Dalton Varsho, we talked about him a few times here as well. He looks really good this spring. I think last episode, you and I talked about how if the Blue Jays were to have a surprise five-war player on this roster, it would be Dalton Varsho. And Davis Schneider, who's... I don't think there's a single Toronto Blue Jay who has more variance between how they could do this year than Davis Schneider. Like he could go on, hit 35 bombs, become an all-star, be a mainstay, turn into like a Brian Dozier, Dan Ugla, or he could be in the minors in May and never see another big league appearance again. Um, So it's very curious of what's going to happen there. But those three players, Riley, tell me what our expectations should be on those guys this year. I think that we'll start with, uh, the easier one of the three and it's called Biggio. I think this guy's probably going to see a lot of time at different positions. I've, yep. I wanted to, see, I kind of had a feeling Chapman was going to go at the end of last year. So it was nice to see Biggio get the innings. I think he plays uh, tremendously above average defense. I won't say it's exceptional, but I think Biggio has gotten is, better defensively. He's, he he's really got, has though. And for the amount of different positions he has played over his career, I think that he's a very, he's very versatile. Jesse, his number one tool coming up through the minor leagues is now starting to show a little bit in Mm -hmm. major league spring training. What are we taking away from that? Well, I, what I'm taking away is you kind of have to uh, dilute that a touch. Uh, Biggio's never hit for a high average, but been like 120 points um, higher on his on base percentage. So, uh, I mean, if he hits 240. That's a 360 on base percentage. I mean, I'm yeah, we'll take that, that every but time. Then has, yep. But then he has to be a 240 hitter. And what's that going to mean? And I I mean, it, I'll lump now Varsho, and it's kind of the swing adjustment. L- trying not to loop the swing. And now I'll uh, move over to uh, Varsho because I think he had way too much loop in his swing. He's having an excellent spring so far, Dalton Varsho. I think he's a lot quicker. He's short to the ball. And I think that goes with his hitting style more. Um, Varsho hit 27 home runs. In his first full season with the Diamondbacks. And I think I said probably, gosh, it'd probably be almost over a year now I, or more. I said, if a guy can hit 27, a guy can hit 30. Yep. And I'm kind of changing my mind a touch on that. Um, if uh, I, I would be surprised me if our show, it would surprise me if our show did hit 30. I'm really expecting a higher um, batting average out of Dalton Varshow this year, just how he has looked in spring trading in small adjustments he has made that are actually major adjustments. I mean, he's got, I think he's got an over a thousand OPS and a, yep. and, and, and he's on got base, some and yeah, on base extra base hits lefty on lefty too, which you didn't see yeah. much of at all last year. 11 points shy of a 500 on base percentage in spring training, dilute that obviously spray, put something in that and then go, okay, what is he in the regular season? We don't know, but it looks good for Dalton Varsho for um, his batting average and his on base percentage. You know, maybe a little deductions in the power numbers. I doubt it. Probably the same as last year, but a 250 average would be great. Now, everyone's favorite hero, Davis Schneider. <laughs> yes, the mustache I, man, Davis I Schneider. Know, I don't know what to make of this. He hasn't been very good in spring so far. He can hit a baseball extremely hard and far. A lot of swing and miss in his game. Jesse, we were kind of talking about the fastball. I was kind of poo-pooing the way Snyder looks at a fastball. And I think the next text you sent me was, yeah, well, he's... Like, and you sent me the statistic when he does hit the fastball. It's, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll, it's, I'll read that now because I have it yeah. here ready. It's um, last season, Davis Schneider swung and missed at more than 53% of the fastballs that he saw, but then he also slugged over 700 on the fastballs he made contact with, which I have no idea what to do with that information. <laughs> well, that's to me, that's between a double and a home run. I mean, if you beat him with the fastball, you beat him. 
uh, with the fastball. And I think that, yeah. uh, uh, you know, a smart pitcher will use that at the right time and going to get Snyder to strike out. Uh, but I, you know what? If David Schneider starts the year in AAA, no one gets sad. No one start, you know, getting angry because he's not there. He's still, you know, he's not the, a super young prospect, but he's got a lot of potential and he will get another chance at the major league. This isn't a one and done. See you later. Like he will get major league at bats. I don't know yep. if it's going to be at the start of the season though. Just, just how he's performed in spring and in the way the rest of the roster is shaping up. So my over under on these three players, the first one was Kevin Biggio. I put his OBP at about 350. You said you might get to 360. So I'm assuming you're taking the over on that. Yeah, one. that's a that's a close idea. one. I I, yeah. I would say I would say I would say over, not by a lot though. And Dalton Varsho had 24 and a half home runs. If you're thinking he can get to 27, do we think he's there? I think he's there. I'm taking the Is over on that one, but over tw over 24 24 and a half. So does he get 24 25 or more? 24 uh, 24 and a half. I'm going to I'm going to take the un, I'm going to take the under on this one. I think mm, the batting average, I, <laughs> I think the batting average significantly improves and I think which that's would help become an, a better overall player. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, it's very good. And then for Davis Schneider, I I put it at a games played prop. I put it at 93 and a half games played simply because if he's playing more than that, it means he's good. And if he's playing less than that, it means he's sucking. So what do you think? Over 93 and a half games played for Davis Schneider. I'm going to take Oh, that's a that's a really tough one, Jesse. I'm going to take the yeah. under just for now. Okay. Just is it because the Blue Jays have a lot of infielders too and we just don't know what to expect? Like Yeah, it's it, 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 me kind of thinking Biggio's going to hold his own um that uh, that another guy Ernie Clement is going to kind of stick around. Yep. And be a more consistent version of 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 what we need in that role that Snyder just and he's he's going to do great for for Buffalo if he's there if he's with the Blue Jays club we hope that he he's able to be that love the comp Dan Ogla Brian Dozier type guy uh cuz we could really use um like a Florida Marlins 2008 type Dan Ogla guy a gritty second baseman great. Speaking of which, Riley, you did kind of mention it there. Um, Ernie Clement has been putting on a show this spring. In fact, he had a triple today and then immediately scored on a wild pitch. And I even wrote in our notes here, he's probably coming for Santiago Espinal's roster spot. Well, if you didn't know, we did trade Santiago Espinal earlier today, so we will get into that a little bit later here, But which fully guarantees Ernie Clement is on this team. He's made it. He's going to be here. Riley, you and I have joked quite a bit this offseason. Well, he was a one more player in 30 games last season. Do the math. Give the guy 150 games. He's a five war player. I know we kind of said that a little tongue in cheek, Riley, but like he looks fantastic. Exit velocity is galore. He's been playing good defense. Like he was hitting lead off in front of Bo and Vlad today. Like Ernie Clement could be a full time player and might even be a top five hitter on the Toronto Blue Jays this year. I'm talking myself into it. I'm all aboard the Ernie Clement hype train, Riley. Um, tell me I'm wrong here. If or don't guy, come on aboard. Join the train. I, with them. Just, just, just to put in perspective, it's a, if a guy with just over 330 at bats with a 64 OPS plus changes that from being on, I think he was sure. with, he was with the guardians. He was with my Oakland A's and uh, maybe another team. I'm not sure. Um, but, but if he, no, just those two teams, but if he can turn that, and basically turn that into a five war, which pretty much eliminates everything we said about Biggio, unless he's playing full time third base. But if Ernie or Clement, right field, if something happens to Springer, like yeah, let's yeah, let's get crazy with it, Jesse. Why not? We're talking about a five war season for Ernie Clement. Uh, nothing sounds crazier than that. I think that'd be amazing. I mean, Jesse, we like this type of guy on this club. Uh, yep. He he. I mean, if there's a hustle guy. If there's kind of another gritty guy, but more of a finesse guy, obviously Davis Schneider, a little more stocky. Um, I think that uh, Ernie Clement, very athletic, very good fielder. And is he getting lucky with some of these hits? Possibly, but he's, he's but, sure. But he's also not though. Like he is earning a lot of these hits. They yes, but so you have to be lucky to be good sometimes in the game of baseball, of as yeah. we all know, Jesse. That there's a lot of variables into the game. And I think I I think everything's going. I mean, uh, he's playing at the at the uh, dice table, rolling lucky number seven every time it <laughs> seems. And I yeah, 
it, it could it could be good. It could just be one of those flash in the pan things too, where Ernie Clement just comes on here, and then all of a sudden he's not so hot, and then it goes from there. Uh, let's move on, Riley. We're getting about halfway through the episode, but just to round out the rest of our lineup here, I want to talk about two players who are known for their defense, but are going to get a lot of at bats this year, and that's Isaiah Kiner Falefa and Kevin Kiermeyer. Kevin Kiermeyer. Great in April, kind of just math the rest of the way. He did say he wanted to hit for more power. He had a two home run game earlier this spring. Um, so he's got three home runs on the spring, which is great for a 34 year old Kevin Kiermeyer. I don't know, we expect more. And Isaiah Kiner Falefa, too, who, if we get anything out of the bat, I think we're going to be happy with that. But he's going to play good defense. And he's, uh, you know, the Blue Jays have really built their team around run prevention. And he is another example of doing just that. Um, so a minute or less, Riley, do you have a thought on those players? I think with. Uh, Kiermaier, I think it's the defense is, is, is real with him. As we all know why he's on this team is not because of his hitting. I think if he wants to yeah. adjust some things, Kevin Kiermaier's never been at, he's a fast guy. That's never been at the top of the order. He's a defensive specialist. If he wants to adjust and make the power, as long as he's not putting himself at like a 175 um, batting average, you know, that's, that's fine. And as far as Isaiah kind of Falefa goes, Oh man, I don't know what to expect uh, from this. It's going to be ugly he's got, with IKF. Dude, he's got Absolutely. he's got tw- he's got twenty six career home runs, and again, he's never hit for really a high batting average. And it, like for me, it's a one or the other. You have the potential to do if you have the potential to do a hit a home run or b lace a single. Like for me, that's kind of what a one through nine guys in the order do. Everyone should be able to hit in the lineup. It, uh, elite defense for Kiermaier, sure, we'll give that exception, but yeah. Because you want a gold glove in the COVID shortened season, I don't know if that classifies you as an elite defender. There's a lot of versatility on where he can play. That's for sure. But if uh, IKF, you know, does something and pops off with double digit home runs for us, Ooh. that's that, that's Ooh. great. I a two forty average in eleven home runs, we would. I mean, we're laughing, but that but talking about that for a third baseman is is crazy. Yeah, um, I I am very expectation low. Uh, IKF would be perfect as a bench guy, guy coming on the bench, coming in late in games to be a defensive replacement. But Jays don't really have a third baseman, and he's gonna get a lot of the reps, right? Like Biggio can stand there, Turner can stand there, um, you know, but they don't have the arm strength to really get it across there. Whereas Isaiah kind of left it does. So we're gonna see a lot of him this year, and we really need him to be productive at least somewhat on a basis. Um, the last thing on position players. Do you have any bold prediction or something wild on Joey Votto, Daniel Vogelbach, Brian Servin, um, Nathan Lucas, or Elvis Martinez, Addison Barger, or just names to know as we get onto the season? Uh, some of the minor league guys, no, not really. The one guy I'm going to take away from that is Daniel Vogelbach because I yep. think that there has to be a spot designated on this roster for him, and I think he's going to be a very effective pinch hit type right-handed special DH, although he has hit a home run off a lefty. And uh, again, it's, this is a kind of a journeyman type DH. I doubt, you know, we have options to play first base. I don't know if you want to talk about a pure DH, it shouldn't be Justin Turner. Vogelbach's more of a pure DH than Justin Turner. So the fact that we have two guys on this roster, Oh, Justin Turner's our DH. And then there's, Daniel Vogelbach standing right there on the bench too. It's like, Hmm, I don't know. At least one guy's played a little bit of third base, but I do. I like Vogelbach. I think he'll be a fan favorite type guy. A lot of swing and miss in his game, but also he's a monster and he will mash if he connects. I agree, Riley. Let's move on to the starting rotation, which was a strength for the Toronto Blue Jays last year, headlined by our ace, Kevin Gosman, who is dealing with a little bit of shoulder fatigue. Um, So he has been slowed so far this spring. If he does miss a start to start the year, it sounds like he's only going to miss one. But monitor this. We don't like seeing our star pitchers, especially our pitchers who have thrown 175 innings or more in each of the last three seasons dealing with any type of shoulder issue, but Blue Jays don't seem too concerned, so therefore I'm not going to be too concerned, but just keep an eye on that going forward. Gosman was our ace, though, last year, Riley. 316 ERA with even better stats under the hood, struck out 31% of the batters he faced. Um, Yeah, he's thrown a lot of innings. The splitter should still be really good. I am a little worried he was worse in the second half last year than he was in the first half. My thought on Gosman all along has been he's still going to be very good. I just don't know if he's going to be elite. Like, he's not going to finish top three in Cy Young voting, but he'll finish top 10. And I feel like you echoed that, uh, that saying. But tell me what you think on Gosman's performance this year. 
I I agree 100%. That's kind of how he's going to finish the year. Jesse, it comes down to we we can predict all these things. Um, I think for a position player, when you predict where they finish in the year, you know, it kind of even things out. But for a pitcher, like that can be really dangerous to kind of say, because wh- how does he start the year? How does he finish right. the year? Where, where, where is he in, in August when we play these this in this series? Like, how's Zach Gosman going to be? Like, and Kevin, Go- or Kevin Gosman kind of dealt with, you know, some walk issues for the first time in his career, kind of later in the year as well. Jesse is like, yeah, walks were think, elevated in the second half. Yeah, it, it, which was which was crazy. I remember thinking that, and it was it's kind of scary, but at the same time, Jesse, I you know at that point I had more faith in Gosman than any starting pitcher going into a ball game, and I still kind of uh, share that same feeling as I did last year. Regardless, because it is Kevin Gosman, I think that we're not going to see. You know, we're probably going to see a mid three ZRA. Uh, maybe the walks in the second half that last year don't creep up. Maybe there's a small decrease in strikeouts. But then again, a guy who throws that splitter, if he gets soft contact, I, I like you're still going to get a top 10 American League pitcher in Kevin Gosman. Um, but then again, if he falls, then that takes away a very good spot in the rotation that we need to be an, an elite guy and I don't know if Gosman can be the elitist of the elite and win that Cy Young I think that would be almost best case scenario and worst case scenario I mean obviously injuries aside is he kind of gets roughed up I don't think he gets roughed up too bad though I mean Gosman for me is still yeah. kind of a sure thing going into the season regardless of what he's dealing with for injuries I think he's a veteran he knows what he has to do to be successful in this league yeah, I agree. Home runs were on the rise a little bit too. And we saw in that uh, wild card start, he gave up a home run to Royce Lewis. It's it's very much a lot of that for Kevin Gosman. Like I said, he's still going to be fine. I'm not too worried about it. But just note that as we get into the season and we're watching Kevin Gosman pitch this year. Uh, moving on to our next one. And a guy who's going to be our opening day starter, Jose Barrios, a guy who I've been kind of on record of not being the biggest fan of him. I didn't love the trade at first, I, um, but he grew on me. He was good. And then when he was bad in 2022, I didn't like that either. Even for the first half of last year, I thought he was getting lucky. But I think we saw a different Jose Brios down in the second half last year. And we've talked about it on an episode earlier this offseason. I am very excited about the cutter that Jose Brios is adding to his arsenal. He's looked really good this spring. He's going to be our guy who's starting up on opening day. I feel very good about Jose Brios. He's been consistently that sinker slider ERA combo. I think if all things go right for Jose Brios this year, we could be looking at like a Corey Kluber in his Cy Young years type of season, which I'm not predicting that Jose Brios will win a Cy Young award, but that is what it will look like if everything comes together, which I think could happen this year. What are your thoughts on Jose Brios and if he can lead this Blue Jays rotation this season? Well, my thoughts are, Jesse, you simply did not watch the late 2010s American League Central because Jose Brios was the best thrower in the late 2010s with the Minnesota Twins. I thought he was... I thought he was going to win a Cy Young 2018, 2019, the way he was dealing back then, a 200 strikeout type guy. The walks and home runs weren't a problem. Um, And then, you know, got shifted over here 2021, partway through the year and, and finished the year very strong. And like you said, 2022, let's forget about that. Um, 2023, Jesse, very good year. Um, He's going to have to really ramp it up in a lot of different categories to be a Cy Young guy. Um, It's been a, I, it's, it's, it's not out of the question. It is certainly not out of the question. I believe Jesse that um, there is something in Jose Barrios's makeup that could lead him down that path. I think it's going to be um, a challenge and I think he's going to have to get lucky and make the right pitches 99.9% of the time to the hitters in order to do that. It's a tough road. It's a tough road for him to get there, but for him to be what we need him to be, I think he can, I think he can pitch better than the line he showed last year for us. Um, I, I still think he's got some of the best uh, pitch pitch types kind of complimentary pitches in baseball. And like you said, the cutter with the slurve, very nice addition there. Um, I like Jose Barrios going into this year. I've always, I've, I never lost faith in faith in Jose Barrios, even Good, when he I was, did. <laughs> I know you did. I, I, I'm yeah. here. I'm here. For, I liked him when he was a twin, and I like him even more as a Toronto Blue Jay. Jesse, we're stuck with him for a while. 
So why don't you like him? Why don't you drink the Kool-Aid of Jose Brios is going to be very good this year. Is he going to win a Cy Young? He's not going to win a Cy Young this year. Uh, I, 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 but he's going to pitch very, very well. This could be another guy. Top 10 in Cy Young voting. Two Blue Jays. Top 10 in Cy Young. Sure. Why not? Yeah, it's literally just going to come down to can he locate that sinker? Is he throwing first pitch strikes? Is he attacking hitters? If he's doing just that, all things go for Jose Brios. Watch for that it's on opening day. We'll get to see it against the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, next pitcher is a guy who actually got 11th in Cy Young voting last year, and that's Mr. 200 innings himself, Chris Bassett. We're expecting another good season from him. The king, I believe, at inducing soft contact. It wasn't as good last year as the year prior, but he was still top 10 in all of baseball in doing just that. The guy who throws seven pitches himself and has a curveball that can w- low it down as 65 miles per hour. Chris Bassett might be my most fun Blue Jay to watch pitch when he is on and he is location he just gets some ridiculous swings from some of those hitters um he had two or three blow-ups last year and other than that he was very solid all the way across the board he, i think he had a, he had a shutout for the blue jays this year he had several times where he'd throw late into the games he's been very good um yeah i i think expect more of the same i don't really see any reason to expect less from chris bassett this season either unless maybe those blow up starts turn into five or six this season instead of two or three but i i just don't really see it happening i think chris bassett as long as he can keep command and control of all seven or eight pitches that he throws i think it's going to be another good year for him if he goes another 200 i think he was 200 on the dot last year right yeah. was it not or yeah. something like if he right could, on the nose, like, two hundred. Yep. If if he does that again this year, that something went extremely right, and I am mm-hmm. all for that. that. Like he was, he was super, he was super, super good for us last year. The fact that yeah, Jesse, better, almost better than Gosman at at pitching well deep into ball games, where it was like you didn't want to take the guy out because he was doing that good, and it's not like he is blowing guys away with the fastball. Uh, this is a guy with the pitches that he throws that's going to get the soft contact at the time. Well, Team Gold Glove last year for the Toronto Blue Jays, and who better to have that um, on the hill than than Chris Bassett to, you know, let the defense do the work, and look what happened. Chris Bassett had, um, I think, the best best year of his career, and that came bounce off a year where he had the best year of his career with the New York Mets after coming from my Oakland days and kind of suffering are things going to ramp up and get better from this year? I would like to think that they're going to stay around the same. Um, maybe a slight decline in almost every category. I, I really don't know. He's a, he's a fun guy to watch. I don't want to root against him because I think that for us to call him our number three guy, I think he's an important part to this team. He's a guy, Chris Bassett's a warrior. They, they call him the hound dog for a reason. The hound dog. Yeah. Rough, rough. He's been very was- good. Yeah. Uh- that was lame. Yeah. That was so lame. <laughs> so lame, Jesse. But that's hey, all if right. If you've been listening to this long enough, you know yeah. it's uh, there's going to be more of that going right. on. All the, all the all the crickets in my yard just you, they were just <laughs> buzzing right like crazy. You didn't hear them, but they were going nuts for you, dude. I believe it. I believe it, my guy. Um, look, he had four starts last year where he had allowed five earned runs or less. Everything else was four or less for Chris Bass, and I expect more of the same. Um, moving on to the next guy who's going to get a lot of good innings this year is Yusei Kikuchi. Last year, he seemed to finally figure out those breaking pitches, the slider and that curveball he added to his repertoire led to one of the good season. You say Kikuchi still has some of the best stuff from the left hand side in all of baseball. He throws 95 with that fastball. He's been working on the change up a lot this spring. And if he can figure that pitch out, then maybe there is another gear. We had Isaac on the show last week and he talked about, he's not quite sure we're going to see a repeat performance from Yusei Kikuchi. And I will say at times it is a stressful watch to watch Yusei Kikuchi because the catcher will be setting up down low and away. Kikuchi puts it in the strike zone, but it's way high and outside. And it's, it's not like he always seems to know where the pitch is going, but his stuff is so good. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, I, Look, Kikuchi's my guy. I love watching Kikuchi. I think he's going to be good yet again. But he was very much the five and dive starting pitcher last year. And I think that's probably the plan again for Yusei Kikuchi going forward, especially in a contract year for him. So tell me what I should feel about Yusei Kikuchi this year. Yusei Kikuchi reminds me of my old throwing partner, Wellington Lynx Hall of Famer, Pat McPherson. And the problem okay. with guys like that is that they can get wild Shout out at to times. Pat. Yeah, he doesn't sure, yeah. watch the he doesn't watch the show absolutely, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Love him anyways. The 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 good things about Kikuchi is the velocity, the strikeouts, um, the, the then the bad things, the walks, the home runs. If he's yeah. able, if he's able to basically just kind of 
hone it in and just and and give his best stuff, which I I, I mean, I think that he's going to be fine this year if we're going to call him our number four starter. I don't think that I, I, I like I would like to see him throw more innings personally. I know that so would I. Like, if he's on, then absolutely. I would on, like that. As well. I know he's kind of a he's like, you know, kind of forbidden three times through the batting order, this and that. But I think he's yep. he's on, let him go. And again, there was there was no holds barred in 2022 for taking him out and moving him to the bullpen and things like that. Like there was uh there was no no question that his leash was real short at one point as a blue jay. And I think now he's shown that he can be a, a, an MLB caliber starting pitcher. And I would like to see him do that. He's, you know, I don't know if he's coming back. This could be his last season in Toronto. And I hope it's a good one. It's got to be. Our best case scenario actually is that Yusei Kikuchi puts together another monster season and he cashes in in the offseason and goes somewhere else, finds another team. If you believe in the contract year narrative for Yusei Kikuchi, a guy who... You know, the Blue Jays did pay him a good amount of money, but a guy who's really looking for like that next payday could happen this season with Yusei Kikuchi. Um, I want to move on. We, we'll talk a lot about Kikuchi as we get into the regular season. But Riley, Alec Manoa, and all I'm going to say on Alec Manoa, because we saw him have one game this spring. He only got five outs. He hit three guys, and even the hits he did give up uh, were not that good. Um, are we going to see him this year, like at all? If you had to put an over... If I put an over under... Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. Actually... My prediction for Alec Manoa, Riley, is come September 1st, is Alec Manoa still on this 40-man roster? Dude, I would have had him in St. Louis in November, first and okay. foremost. <laughs> um, I, I think he's still on the 40-man roster in, in November. Um, I would like yes, to say, I, I'm going to say that he's going to, I'm going to say that he's going to get um, around 10 starts this year. I don't okay. have an over under. So I think that I think that he's going to be given the opportunity, and I think Jesse, this has got to be the last straw, right? It's got to be because think about like, what's going to happen. He's he's hurt right now, right? So he's got a shoulder injury. He's not going to be on the team on opening day. He's likely going to start the season on the IL. He's going to go through a rehab assignment, which I believe is twenty eight days. You can spend in the minor leagues. That's four starts. So we're going to get four starts worth in Buffalo before, and he's got to get through that healthy. First of all, if he does that, we will should know by those four starts, if he's good enough to pitch even out of the big league bullpen this season, um, we should know. I, I think the chances of Alec Manoa coming back and being that Cy Young award guy, I think are gone. Like there is a chance he's Chris Carpenter. He goes to another team and figures it out and becomes a stud and wins a bunch of pitching awards. But I really do not think so with Alec Manoa. I think the guy just lost it. And I don't think he's going to get it back. Yeah. What team did we trade Chris Carpenter to Jesse? <laughs> oh yeah. The Cardinals. Oh yeah. Funny how yeah. I did that. Eh? Funny, funny yes. how there's Interesting. funny how there's reasoning behind this brain. Sometimes I, <laughs> man, I am, I am still so kind of ticked that Manoa gave up um, partway through the year. Didn't report because of the demotion and then kind of basically, he's kind of said F you to the guys. And my, yeah, my he point quit on the team last season. It, it, sour it, taste it's my mouth. awful. It is. It is awful. And I and I, if you're a 36 year old veteran who's been in the league for 14 years, I think that's more okay. But you finish in the top three, Cy Young voting once, and you still have options. Nah, buddy. Like you're riding the bus. You're not yeah. flying. To, you're not flying to the West Coast. You're you're on the bus, man, because uh, you showed your true colors there. And I. I like. I'm not going to talk about character clauses and get into personality things, but I think Alec Manoa better smarten up on that front as as well. And kind of okay. you see guys like you see guys like Bo Bichette, who's kind of made himself and kind of presented more professionalism and and displayed a really good um you know kind of leadership attribute. Um, if Manoa could kind of take an ounce of that and and turn that onto his personality, I think that would really benefit him. When he does toe the slab, though, um, yeah. Uh, five, what, five, five outs, five batters faced or five. Yeah. You got five outs in five uh, outs. So try it, yeah. 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 So, uh, um, one and two thirds innings pitched and hit two batters, um, three batters, <laughs> hit three batters. We know he likes to hit batters, but it, the, the, yeah. what I'm trying to say is, you know, fishing out those numbers is that's not very good. I think that, yeah, he, there might have to be a lot of rehab assignments because we shoved them up. We had this debate with with Isaac last year on the show, Jesse, where it was just like, oh, yep. well, what, what, when do we see Alec Manoa back? We saw him back way too early. So this, for me, this is yeah, kind I of agree. the last straw. Like, this something's something's got to move, man, because we can't have this on a 
winning ball club. It's 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 unacceptable. All right, and with the guy who's going to be replacing Alec Manoa in the starting rotation is Bowden Francis, who last season or last episode, Riley, you told me you were going to get a Bowden Francis tattoo if he goes out and uh, he shoves this season. I think he's got to come top ten in Cy Young voting, which I, I don't think is going to happen either. But uh, that's what I'm rooting for going into the season is get a nice Bowden Francis tattoo. And look, the stuff looks good. He's at his best, like every pitcher, when that fastball is more 95, 96 than it is when it's 91, 92. But you can say that for anybody. And that curveball is really good. It's a legit pitch. Um, Stuff Plus really likes that curveball from Bowden Francis. He's going to get a run here. He was good in the bullpen for the Blue Jays last year, too. So we will see. We'll see him a lot earlier in the season. Um, I don't really have much else to add on him, Riley. But we also got to talk Ricky Tiedemann, who is the Blue Jays' top prospect, who's going to get a lot of talk as the season goes on. Likely to start the season down in AAA Buffalo as the Blue Jays are going to try to work up his innings. I think he only threw 60-some innings between the stint of the Arizona Fall League and in the minors last season. So the Blue Jays want to make sure that stuff can perform. He's shown flashes of good stuff this spring, but also shown flashes of inconsistency, kind of like he's young and he hasn't thrown a lot of big league innings. Um, But Ricky Tiedemann is going to be a name to know. What should the Blue Jays do with this young kid as we go into the season? Well, I first want to touch that, uh, just to touch on Bowden Francis, just real quick. Yes, of course. That no one should, if he's if he is shoving, Jesse, do not take him out of that rotation. That is mistake Agreed. number one. Yep. Even, hey, Ricky Tiedemann's still very young, and he will have a chance this year to throw innings at the major league level. And mm-hmm. I think that I think that he is, you know, it, well, top 50 prospect. Could it be as high as, what is he, 19th right now? Of all MLB, it's it depends on the list you look at. Yeah, but he's anywhere sure. between like twenty and forty. Yeah, sure. Well, whatever. Nineteen, twenty, same number basically. I think that there's a lot to like about Ricky Tiedemann, and the thing is that he hasn't thrown, you know, a ton of. There's not a lot of longevity in in the starts that he's gotten. So for him, to, like, let's start that. Let's start the year in the minor leagues, and then build up those innings before we even think about starting in in the major leagues. I think that's really going to help him long term. We have a really good thing with him. Let's not screw it up. Honest honestly, yeah, that's like the Blue Jays have screwed up their pitching prospects in the past every, like Nate every Pearson. starting yeah, like, every starting pitcher that isn't named Roy Halladay. Um we we've screwed up. I, honestly, and look at the, yeah. It, 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 like yeah, look at the track record. Uh you po- Jim Jim Clant Jim Clancy, I think was our draft pick and he went on to do what mediocre? Yeah, no. If you're not Roy Halladay, look at the list goes on. I I could name all the Ricky Romero's from the past twenty years. I won't. Right, but like even in the Ross Atkins era, like Alec Manoa looked like a a guy, but he was a college pitcher who rose to the big leagues very early. And now look at Alec Manoa, right? Like the Blue Jays have built the rotation pretty much through trades or free agent signings, like Bassett, Gosman, Kikuchi, all free agent signings, right? And Brios was a trade, like they have really struggled to develop pitching. So you really, really want to get Ricky Tiedemann right because it's going to go a long way for the Blue Jays to reach their upside. I think there's a chance he probably comes up and he pitches in the bullpen this season because the Blue Jays want to limit his innings. Kind of like what Aaron Sanchez did when he was first coming up his first year. He kind of threw out of the bullpen for a while before they moved him into the rotation in 2016. I feel like the Blue Jays will go on a similar plan with Ricky Tiedemann this year. Um, And I want to touch on just one more guy who might get some starts this year. He was one of our bigger free agent signings of the offseason is Yariel Rodriguez, who we're just now getting to see some looks at in spring. The stuff looks good. But again, like Ricky Tiedemann, has barely thrown any innings over the last four years. He's here on a four-year contract, and this is the only season the Blue Jays can send him to the minor leagues. So he will be an extended part of the Blue Jays rotation going into next year, and probably sooner rather than later in this year. Um, So what are your thoughts on Yariel Rodriguez really quick before we move on to the rest of the bullpen? I think it's not a bad thing if he is in the minor leagues to start, Um, but I think it's it's kind of one of those situations that he – he is going to be thrown into the water at some point, and it's going to be very much sink or swim. And we hope that we did make a good decision in signing him as an international free agent. I think I think it looks good. I, I think that there is a chance that he – I think there's a lot of roads he could take. Whether he is an – I think there's a chance he's an elite setup type guy in Major League Baseball, and I think there's a chance that he will be a very good three, four piece to a rotation. But again, it's how how we use him, and then obviously the worst case scenario is it, basically he's he's not pitching at in the major leagues, or he's dealt, or he's released, and it's a very mixed bag, right? When you get guys who have only really, I can't comment because I haven't actually really seen him play aside from yeah, not many people have. Game. 
I, I, I'd be lying if I said I turned on the TV and watched um, international baseball with Yario Rodriguez pitching. So, again, I don't know what to expect, but, uh, I mean, it, there's a lot of potential, and it could go either way. All right, let's get into the bullpen here. We don't have to spend too, too much time on this, but we do got to talk about our closer, Jordan Romano. And if you didn't hear the news lately, he just got some anti-inflammatory injections in his pitching arm, which you never want to see. Uh, Jordan Romano was grunting a lot this spring. I don't know if that was by choice. He wanted to get the Robbie Ray kind of type vibes in there where he starts screaming while he pitches, or if maybe he just doesn't feel like his fastball has enough zip and he had to do that to get the little extra. The fact he's going through some arm injuries right now, the Blue Jays haven't ruled out him being unavailable for opening day, but again, it's never something you like to see, especially from someone who throws as hard as Jordan Romano does. He did kind of take us. He was still really good, but he did kind of take a little bit of a step back last season. Um, his ERA has slowly risen each of the last four seasons and his walk rates have slowly risen each of the last four seasons. He should still be good. That slider is one of the best sliders the Blue Jays have in their entire system. Um, if I put the over under for saves for Jordan Romano at 29 and a half, Riley, does he get there? Yeah, he's, he's, he's hitting 30 saves this year, but you know, that's, that's thank you for proposing that question. I love counting stats, Jesse. I know you don't get yeah, a crap. Knew you did. Saves. The, the blown, the blown saves is, is what is more important than saves in my, in my point of view. And it would be nice to see Jordan Romano kind of stay along the same trajectory as, as which he is going. I mean, he's still he is still an all star level closer, top five in the American League, top fifteen in all of baseball. But top fifteen is just half the field as far as closers go. And if he shoves, if he does what he can do and gets those strikeouts, then we're looking we're looking at those thirty saves. We're looking at a successful ball club um, when there is a save situation. For what it's worth, elbow injuries are scary, and he's being shut down from throwing for at least a few days, so I'd almost assume it's likely he begins the season on the IL. Eric Swanson's dealing with forearm issues, too, and we know Eric Swanson wasn't in camp for most of spring because of the tragic accident with his son, so understandable. But forearms aren't good for pitchers, either. They're usually like a, a lead-in to Tommy John, which is never something you want to see. So let's assume, just at least to start the year, that both Jordan Romano and Eric Swanson are not ready to go for this team. Who's your closer? Opening day. Gimme Yemi. Gimme Jimmy Garcia, man. That's 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 the, that's the guy I that's the guy I think we should see. I could have if I could have answered Chad Green, but he did not have a very good outing in the last couple of days. I don't know. I, I, I haven't watched the um the I didn't watch the game today. I didn't watch the game yesterday, so it was in the last uh three to four days that this happened. I didn't love what I see from Green, but I really like what I've seen uh, from Garcia so far. Yeah, and Jimmy Garcia's stuff too, just the 98 mile per hour fastball, the good sweeping stuff. I agree. I think he could be in line for saves. Um, a sleeper choice, I guess, for a guy who could come in and be a closer, Nate Pearson. I can't quit Nate Pearson, and he can't throw strikes with that fastball, so he's got to get that going first. But he might now have a spot into our bullpen. And I hate to say this, Riley, because he's looked awful this spring. Zach Pop might actually find a way onto the opening day roster in this bullpen too, if there are these bullpen issues. But the good news is the Blue Jays do have a ton of depth and a ton of good arms in their bullpen down in Buffalo. Hayden Junger, for example, um, Yaz Verzulueta. Like there's a lot of guys with a lot of good stuff coming up who could be ready to jump in and take a role. So I'm not too worried about the performance of our bullpen, but there are some question marks heading into the season and isn't something you'd like to see. I mean, it's a short-term problem that we can solve but if the if a bullpen problem proceeds and it's just a long term problem, then we're going to run into problem because we run into the the um you know the fatigue and the, the depth chart kind of getting thinned out. I mean, if you're to lose Swanson and Romano for an extended period of time, that is not going to look good short term. I think we I think we nip it in the butt and it's and it's everything plays out just fine. Yeah, remember in that 2021 season, the Blue Jays missed the playoffs by one game. Um, if we made the trade to get Adam Simber and Anthony Bass earlier in that season and Trevor Richards too, if we made that trade earlier than we did, the Blue Jays are a playoff team. So we can see a bad bullpen sink you. So we got to make sure these guys are performance. Find the right group as quick as possible as you can. Don't throw a Trevor Richards out there for too long so we can be another Rafael Dolis or Tyler Chatwood just because you've committed money to him or whatever it is. You need to find the guys who are going to produce and you need to find those guys that are going to come in quickly here, Riley. Um, any note on any other pitchers? I Actually, I did want to mention Tim Meza. Um, I know it's just spring training, but he did not look so good in his last spring. Velocities were down all across the board. He didn't look comfortable as well either. 
I hope he's not hurt. I don't know. The Blue Jays say his next spring training game is going to be in a minor league game on the backfields, which I don't love to see that either. So maybe there is something going on with Tim Meza, which really puts the back end of our bullpen in strains. But uh, yeah, any other of our pitchers, Genesis Cabrera, maybe um, Trevor Richards. Like, do you have a thought on any of those guys or can we move on? No, I Trevor Richards. Yeah, the best way to throw Trevor Richards is not at all. Um, I would like to see Yanis <laughs> Cabrera get, get get you know get some innings, especially if Mesa is kind of on the back burner for now. Um, if we have a good lefty going, um, uh, you know, at least one of if, if at least one of them are going to start the year, I think I think that's good, and then we get healthy again and things start to kind of look better um, from the side of the bullpen. All right. And if you haven't noticed by now, you can kind of expect it. We are going to go a little bit long here, but we have a lot to cover on this season preview. We want to make sure we cover every single basis of this Toronto Blue Jays team. We are also about to give our predictions on who we think the MVP are, who we think the Cy Young Awards winner is going to be. We're also going to try to give you a win total prediction and try to predict exactly how the Blue Jays are going to do into the World Series. But first, let's predict our opening day roster because this is the last episode we're going to do until there are actual games being played. So I want to take a stab at this and uh, try to go for the opening day roster. Now, we're going to assume uh, Danny Jansen and Alec Manoa begin the season on the IL. We are not going to assume that Jordan Romano and Eric Swanson do. Let's assume they are part of the pen and they are in the back end of our bullpen. Gotcha? Yep. Okay. I think we can all agree our starting rotation, Barrios, Bassett, Kikuchi, Gosman, if he's ready to go, and Bowden Francis is our five. Correct? That's that's I got to say. I don't have it written down, but that sounds exactly right. Yeah. So our catchers, because Danny Jansen's on the IL, will be probably Brian Servin, who we think has got the leg up on Peyton Henry to be our backup catcher this spring behind Alejandro Kirk. That is that. I'm going with Servin as as well to back up Kirk. All right. And then the starting rotation or the starting rotation of infielders, I guess. We'll go Vlad. We'll put Biggio at second, but I mean, second base will be a platoon. Bichette at short, which means we're putting Isaiah kind of for left at third. And then the outfield of Varsho, Kiermaier, Springer, and Turner at DH. That all sound right to you? Yep, that's 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 exactly right. Now, that's well, that's, I think, the easy part. Now, Jesse, comes the hard yes, part. Yes, now it gets interesting. <laughs> yes. So we got to touch uh, on the bench here. We, the Blue Jays are going to have a backup catcher. Brian Servin is likely going to be that guy. But then that leaves really three spots because I do think the Blue Jays are going to go with eight relievers to begin the year, especially because our pitchers aren't bulked up. And especially if they are dealing with injuries, you're not going to put Swanson on a back-to-back. You're not going to put Romano on a back-to-back quite yet. So I think eight relievers is almost a guarantee for the Toronto Blue Jays this team, which leaves just three position player bench spots available. I wrote Ernie Clement, who is on this team, almost guaranteed. I don't think there's a doubt in my mind he doesn't make this team. We don't trade Espinal today if Ernie Clement's not making this team, which then leaves, I guess, Davis Schneider and Daniel Vogelbach were kind of, were my two choices to make this team, which leaves out like a true outfielder like Nathan Lucas. It leaves out Joey Votto. It leaves out like Eduardo Escobar or any of those guys making this team. Do you agree with that or do you have a different name you wanted to throw in there? I I, I don't have a different list. I think that's I think that's really, really accurate, Jesse. I don't think Eduardo Escobar should make this team. And I think we would kind of be silly, kind of gimmicky to throw Votto um, just up in that spot. And I, and I look, you can look at Nathan Lucas and go, um, you know, he's, he's, he's paid his dues as a minor leaguer. Yeah, he's had a good sure. spring too, for what it's worth. He, Three hits he has. And I mean, I he know. would, it's between, if he's on the chopping block, the next guy, it's between him and Davis Schneider, because with that list, Drew, I'm, I'm as well going Ernie Clement besides Brian Servant. I'm going Ernie Clement, who has performed very well, Vogelbach and then as the, as the next guy. And then for me, it would, it would be between uh, a Lucas and a, um, Another guy there. It's so it's it's quarter to eleven, Jesse. Who the who the heck were we just talking about as the other guy? Hold on, Daniel, don't tell me. Oh. Vogelbach, Servin, Clement. Oh, Davis Schneider, not making Davis the Schneider. Roster. That's yeah. right. Sorry. Yeah. No, I I have Davis Schneider um, not making it if Lucas does make it, and and vice versa. I think they're kind of the the kind of one A one B on the chopping block. Yeah, we talked about too. Like, look, Davis Schneider. Like, he's a right, if he's not going to start, he's a right-handed hitter, a guy who hits for power. Every single pitcher in the Rays rotation is right-handed, so Davis Schneider's not going to start any of those games. So maybe it's best you go with the outfield, like the defensive outfielder, and Nathan Lucas, a guy who could maybe 
do the smaller things better and won't give you a strikeout in a big spot. And I think the Blue Jays might actually go there. The only thing too with Daniel Vogelbach, if he does make this team, the Blue Jays have two 40-man roster spots. Of, oh, sorry, one 40-man roster spot after trading Santiago Espinal today. We're going to assume that Brian Servin gets that spot because he needs to be a backup catcher, which means we need to cut somebody or trade somebody else in order to put Daniel Vogelbach on the roster. So stay tuned for that. Uh, yeah, that's for me. That's a, a bull, a bullpen type arm. That's not gonna make it. Maybe Zach Jesse. Maybe a Zach Pop type guy. Who knows? Maybe maybe Trevor Richards. Right, and let's get into the bullpen then, because eight relievers. I assume we're gonna go Romano, Swanson, assuming they're healthy. Chad Green, Jimmy Garcia, Tim Meza, Genesis Cabrera are locks. Correct. That that's that six. is that's six guys right there, Jesse. Now comes the tough right. part again, and I know who you're gonna say probably first. Yeah, well, I'm. I, were you thinking Mitch White? I was thinking you were going to say Nate Pearson. No, no, no. I don't I actually don't think Nate Pearson starts this team, uh, starts this league on this team. Mitch White is out of options, and he's throwing 98 now. Now he's been walking the world in spring, and he was walking the world down in the second half last year. But I think Mitch White is on this team, especially because he can give you two or three innings out of the pen. And I guess the, I don't think the Blue Jays are ready to let go of Trevor Richards, at least not yet. So he's likely on this team as well. Which means your guys like your Nate Pearson, like your Zach Pop, like um, all those other guys who we've seen a lot of this spring aren't going to be on the big league roster to start this year. Well, that's unfortunate. I know that you're really high on Nate Pearson, but if you're high on Nate Pearson, I'm so low on Trevor Richards. I would have loved to see your boy get that spot. If that happens, I mean, relievers are a dime a dozen, man. Everyone has their, everyone has their, every dog has its day and Trevor Richards needs to be put down as far as a Blue Jays pitcher. And I think, I think Nate Pearson's got tremendous stuff. Um, if he, if he knows what planet he's going to throw it to. And I, I mean, there's a lot of upside and I, well, you can take one wacky wild card guy. And I don't, don't know if I would go with a Zach pop. All right. Well, Riley, that's our prediction for the opening day roster. We will find out. We will tweet it out on our social media channels. We'll put it on Facebook. We'll put it everywhere. You will see it everywhere. If you are a Toronto Blue Jays fan, um, you will see it everywhere we can go. With that being said, Riley, we got to go over our team awards. Who's going to be our MVP? Who's going to be our Cy Young? And so on and so forth. So Riley McConnell, take it away. The 2024 Toronto Blue Jays MVP player will be... Bo Bichette. Bo Bichette, eh? I'm and going is, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. I know you are. And that's not on grounds that Vlad has a bad year. I think that it's somewhere around the, you know, the 30 five home run mark, you know, plus or minus a few. But I think Bo Bichette is going to be tremendous as player. Lead this, lead the team in war. This guy is going to be tremendously improved defensively, and he's going to be an absolute force at the plate, as we all know and have seen throughout his career so far. I'm going Vladimir Guerrero Jr. just because I think the power is going to come back in a big way. He's going to hit a ton of home runs. He'll get over 100 RBIs. He might get actual MVP consideration throughout the league. So that's where I'm going with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. But no real wrong answer on that one. Riley, the Blue Jays Cy Young Award winner this season will be. I'm going to back you, Jose Barrios. I'm with you as well. I actually think it's going to be Jose Barrios. I really do think he's going to have a better season than Kevin Gosman this year. Not that Kevin Gosman's going to be bad. I just like what I've seen. And I do think Jose Barrios is going to take a step forward this year. The control is going to be better. And that cutter, if is good, could be a real dynamite pitch for Jose Barrios. And I really do think um, he could have what might be his best season of his career this season in Toronto. I'm With that being said, Riley, jumped gold glove. That. I finally jumped aboard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Blue yeah. Jays are a great defensive team. We've had great defenders all over the field. Your prediction for the Blue Jays Gold Glove Award winner is? Give me Varsho. Give me Dalton Varsho. I think that makes sense. He's going to be in the lineup every single day, bouncing from left to center. His DRS and um, other defensive metrics were off the charts. He should have won this award last year for all of Major League Baseball. I agree. Um, Kiermaier is a great pick. Isaiah kind of left, but if he plays good defense, is a good pick. Um, Jose Brios won a gold glove last year. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has won one in the past. Kirk is a great framer behind the plate. But it, this is Dalton Varsho's award, plain and simple. 100%. Kiermaier, not a bad guy to pick either. All right. This one's a little more intriguing, Riley. Who is your pick for the Toronto Blue Jays Rookie of the Year in 2024? So let let me fly with this, and it's not going to be because he's top 10. 
in Cy Young voting, but give me Bowden Francis. Okay. So you think he's going to hold down the fort, be productive, be our best I rookie? think he's going to hold down the fort. I think he's going to give very respectable numbers as a starting pitcher. And then if he proceeds to, you know, go and have a bullpen role at some point, who knows? A lot of versatility there. I think he's going to, I don't, it would be exceptional if he did. And I got that tattoo. I don't think that's happening, but I think he'll be our best rookie and he'll be very steady for us. Yeah. I don't think Ernie Clement or Davis Schneider still qualify as rookie status. So you can't put them on there. Ricky Tiedemann is our best prospect and we expect him to have playing time up on this, uh, on this team and should be productive. There's a lot of good relievers coming up from the system that can be productive as well. But my pick, Riley, for the Blue Jays Rookie of the Year, Yariel Rodriguez. I do think he comes up, and I do think he does perform. That stuff is so good. I think he could provide an impact. Might be out of the bullpen. Maybe it's as a closer if we do lose Jordan Romano. But I think he's going to be a stable force pitching somewhere, whether it's starting or whether it's relieving. Yariel Rodriguez is my pick. I think it's very gutsy for us to take two. I think position players are the easy outs for questions like these. I think we're bold yep. for saying pitchers. Good on us, Jesse. Yeah, proud of us. We're not. Uh, we're not going uh, with safe picks. We have to take a little chance here on Buds. And that Buds. was dangerous. Let's see how that pays off. Yeah. All right, and then I have uh, two more. I have who? I guess we can lump them together in one. The Blue Jays' biggest surprise this season, and then in counteract, the Blue Jays' biggest disappointment this season. Riley, you can go first. Okay. I haven't pre-hearsed this at all, but I'm going to go with a guy that I'm going to jump on and say that Kevin Biggio, biggest surprise. And good surprise, Biggio, for us. And I'm going to say biggest letdown. Yes. Yeah, we mean this in a positive way. I, I, don't, I, want, I want to say biggest letdown with a grain of salt. I do think it's going to be a Kevin Kiermeyer. Not because of his defense, but I think maybe an abysmal year at the plate may be coming. Riley, I also had um, Kevin Biggio as my biggest surprise up here, but I want to throw out some honorable mentions like um, Ernie Clement could come in here, just have a monster year, tear it apart. Danny Jansen stays healthy as a 25 home run season, although I don't think that would surprise a ton of people. Maybe Alec Manoa comes back and just figures it out. That would sure be a surprise. We would be surprised here. And in terms of my biggest letdown, um, it's Justin Turner. I really do not think a good season from Justin Turner is coming. Shouldn't surprise anybody. But I want to throw out some things like maybe Yusei Kikuchi isn't that good. Maybe Chris Bassett um, has a few more blowups than we think he does. And I, I want the caveat, too, that this is not injury related. If we lose somebody out for the season after three weeks into the year, then I don't think that should count. This should be strictly performance based. Um, and Justin Turner is my pick for that. I, I know that uh, I, I think we can, I can agree with that. I, um, I, how long can he hold on Jesse? We are going to find out here soon. Yep. I agree. And with that being said, Riley, the only other things we have left to predict is the team is the team itself. So Riley, how many games are the Toronto Blue Jays going to win in 2024 and where in the division will we finish? Okay. So third tied for th like third in the division tied with the four team, depending on how the run differential. So we play game 163, we lose game 163. We finish the year 84 and 78 so it's actually 84 and 79 is my prediction okay so so you're thinking we go into a play-in game for that six wild card spot we don't yes. get that game 163 i hey i dude it's things might get wacky and i hate to say it jesse but just just the way that the rest of the league looks right now i mean i I'm able to change my opinion of how this year goes but by of course. Of i course. only know of what's put in front of me right now and sadly, I can't sit and watch every app out of spring training. I could be missing something big here. But, you know, spring training, notoriously, you know, don't pay too much attention to it. Regular season is basically, I mean, in an hour, it'll be a week away, um, which is fantastic. Yeah. Jesse, I can't wait, dude. And we're going to watch a lot of good baseball. And I think that the problem is there's going to be a lot of teams that we play that are going to be playing some good baseball. We got to get on that level, man. We got to get out to a hot start. Sadly, that's my prediction, man. I'd love to see the postseason, but I think it stops at 163 games. 
Yeah, vibes are not high for this Toronto Blue Jays team right now. I put us at 86 wins, so that puts us, what, at 86 and 74, if my math is correct. 70. Um, I do. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. I do have us in one of the wild card positions again, and once you get in there, who knows? I think this can go either way, Riley. I think things could click. We stay healthy. The rotation's good. Vlad turns into an MVP. We finally win the division. I remember that 2015 season, which was for... Blue Jays fans our age was the best season we've seen. I remember vibes sucked at the start of that season because Marcus Stroman tore his ACL and like we were not feeling confident about that team going into spring. That season turned out okay. So there is a chance that this season also turns out okay. But there is also a chance, man, we fall apart and we're like a 76 win team. We're contemplating selling at the trade deadline. But uh, 86 is my official prediction for the Toronto Blue Jays. But boy, we are in for a hell of a ride going into this year. Dalton Pompey is a police officer now. Just, yeah, I want to throw in a 2015 thing. That's crazy. How long? That's, yeah. that's, in another season, that'll be 10 years. My Mind-blowing stuff, Jesse. Yes, the vibes are not high. We on Buds and Blue Jays like to kind of, you know, be realistic. I know that there's a lot of other podcast channels that are real. Jesse, can you believe this? The Toronto Blue never Jays are going yeah. to win the 2024 <laughs> World Series. Justin Turner, 54 home runs. Oh, can you believe it? No. <laughs> I think that we want to try and be, I mean, we say ridiculous things, but I want to be as realistic as we possibly can. The division around us has gotten better, and we took a step back this offseason, plain and simple. Yeah, like more war going out than coming back in and relying on the guys internally to get better, especially for a team that we're relying on so many guys on the wrong side of 30 is incredibly risky to do. And with no real big prospects, aside from Ricky T, that have been coming up in the farm to save us. It, it could be a tough season for us Toronto Blue Jays. But obviously, we're hoping that's not the case because we're going to be doing episodes after every series. And I want to have more fun, upbeat, positive episodes than I do with negative ones. So for the content, please, Toronto Blue Jays, let's get together and let's have a good year. And that season will start one week from tonight, most likely when you are listening to this episode in Tampa, in the trop, let's get off to a hot start, set the tone right, and let's go on with a bang this season. I want to, I want to officially give the first thumbs up of the 2024 Toronto Blue Jays. I want to give let's it to it. two guys. I want to give it to two guys. I want to give it to two guys. I want to give it to Jesse and Riley from Buds and Blue Jays. Let's get go. Us yep, for absolutely. The off season. Yeah, I'll give myself a pat on the back. Why not? We can get just as excited too. Jesse and I are going to be insanely invested this year as we always are. And we're, we're ready. We're locked and loaded to bring you those series recaps, man. I, dude, we're almost there. We're at the top of the hill. We just have to coast our way down and we're there. We've almost reached our destination. All right. Well, that is going to do it for our official 2024 Blue Jays season preview. I think we covered most of the players, all the major storylines that we're going to try to follow this season, gave our predictions. And um, you tell us what you think. How do you think the Blue Jays are going to do this year? Leave a comment, like the video, tell a friend, share it, all the things. That'll likely be our last episode until after the series against Tampa Bay. Obviously, if there is some dramatic news, if the Blue Jays for some reason sign Jordan Montgomery or J.D. Martinez, we will come back and we will do an episode on that. But until then, this is likely going to be it. Remember, in season, we do 30-minute episodes recapping to each series. So our show will be a little bit different. And we're going to have a whole bunch of fun this season. We're going to be active. I've got a Blue Jays bingo card coming out. So stay on the look for that. We're going to be very active, posting a bunch of clips, a lot of videos, all things Blue Jays related. So if you are looking for Toronto Blue Jays content, you are at the right place. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, all that good stuff. Hang out with Riley and I for out the course of the summer as uh, the boys of summer are back. And so are we. Riley, do you have anything else you would like to add before we get out of here and before the season officially starts? I, Jesse, I think we've said enough, man. We'll be yeah. back. I don't know if there's any big news, but we're, we'll be back to cover that Tampa series. Let's hope that it's the start that we need to have a good and successful year in 2024. Let's do it. With that being said, let's go Blue Jays and let's get off to a bang. Thanks, guys. Thank you.